Jingity jing, hee haw, hee haw, it's Dominic the donkey. Jingity jing, hee haw, hee haw, the Italian Christmas doll. Okay, cut the crap. Today we're going to be learning some circular motion and, in specific, centripetal acceleration. All right, what is centripetal acceleration? Well, centri well let's take something and spin it in a circle. Like, for example, this cool looking ball. Let's put this in the pocket for a second. And let's also close the cap because you don't want it drying out, do you now? Let's close that. So here's our ball. You might have noticed it while I was singing. While I was spinning the ball, you probably noticed I let go of it at about here. So here's our string. Here's our ball. And you might have noticed that after I let go of it, when the string was in about this position, then it flew off with this velocity. So now, do you notice something about the angle between the string and the velocity? That's right, they're perpendicular. That's one of the main ideas of circular, or circular and uniform in general motion, or uniform and in general circular motion. So, if you draw a circle like this, which uh, shows the path uh, where you spin an object on, you might notice that at any point in the path, the velocity will be perpendicular to the string or the radius. So, that basically means that the velocity is tangential to its path, meaning that it's parallel to the tangent line on a circle at that point. Okay, so what is centripetal acceleration anyways? Well, centripetal acceleration is, well, it's called centry for a reason because it's the acceleration towards the center of a circle. It's denoted with AC. Why is it towards the center? Well, allow me to demonstrate something. Not literally with this guy. We've already demonstrated all we could with him, but Let's take a big view of the circle, or rather a little slice of the circle. So here is the string at one position. Let's lower it a little. Here is the string in a different position. So now, here we have two of these guys. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the tangent lines here and also notice how I'm drawing them such that they are perpendicular to the string. So now, what happens if we combine these two? What happens if I take this guy, basically copy it over here? Now, I'm just eyeballing this, but you might see that it goes something like that. And now, imagine the entire circle like this. If we subtract these two vectors from one another, then we get delta V from V2, which is this one, and V1. So this delta V points in the direction of the center of the circle. And if you can't see it, then let's take this delta V and put it in the position of the first ball. and you can see that that delta V points in the direction of the center of the circle. This isn't just a coincidence. That's how it works. And if delta V points in one direction, then acceleration will point in that direction also because it's simply the rate of change in the, uh, of velocity or delta V over delta T. So, that means that acceleration is just a vector divided by a scalar like time. And so that means that acceleration will simply point in the same direction as velocity. All right, enough of the blibber blabber. How do we quantify centripetal acceleration? Well, centripetal acceleration can be quantified using this equation. But what's behind this hollow self in equation? You probably haven't learned that yet. In fact, I haven't learned it in my physics class. So let's see what's behind it. Let's take another little slice of the circle, but instead this time make it even more little. And I'm sure you already get the gist by now, so I can probably erase this. 
Okay. So now what I'm going to do is take one little radius of the circle over here, then another little radius of the circle over here. And you can see there's barely even a difference. So now I'm going to erase these balls. Don't say anything about the word balls. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the perpendicular vectors. And one thing you should notice is that we have these two r's. We have v1 and v2. One thing you should notice is that if we have this angle delta theta over here, we see that this r, I don't know, let's call it r1, is perpendicular to v1. This one, I guess we'll call it r and I'll be creative this time, so I'll call, I'll call it RS, because Suborno starts with S. V, uh, it's perpendicular to V2. Just for convenience, let, let's flip that S backwards and make it a 2. So, if, we, uh, if these two guys are perpendicular to these two, and the angle between them is delta theta, then you can also say that the angle between V1 and V2 is delta data because that's how geometry works so now you might notice this little arc here let me erase the angles just because it's important you might notice this arc here is basically the same as the side of a triangle and now here comes the big realization let's take this same v1 and v2 triangle but let's make it a little bigger so here's our V1, and V1 and V2 are of the same magnitude because we're covering uniform circular motion. So that means that the speed is the same, but the directions are different. So now, V1 and V2, you might notice that this is essentially, but not exactly, perpendicular. This is our delta V, this is our theta. And now we can basically equate these guys to one thing, V because they are of the same magnitude. So we have V, V, and then delta V here. And then we have the same angle here. And we realize that these R's are the same because they're two different uh, radii of the of same circle. Do you see the realization here yet? If not, let me show the whole solution to you. So, now we have V1 and V2, which we'll just refer to as V from now on. V1 was this way, V2 was this way, and delta V was this way, and delta theta was this way. And as you can see, this is a demonstration of similar triangles. Why? Because this is, we have one angle that is the same, and then both of these are isosceles triangles. So, since we know these are isosceles triangles and one of the angles are the same, these two triangles must be similar. And the reason for that is because if one angle is here and then we have these two sides uh, that are isosceles, then the other two angles are basically 180 minus delta theta over 2 or 90 minus half delta theta. And that's true for both of these triangles. So that means that these are similar by, I guess you could say, A, 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 because all three of the angles are congruent. All right, so now enough of the blibber blabber. You know how we call this guy, and let's just erase these for a second and move them. You know how I call this guy over here? This is why I wished I had red. I called this guy over here delta L, did I? I might not have, but let's call it delta L for our sake. So now, having R, R, and delta L, and then V, V, and delta V, we can write a proportion. So we know that delta L is to delta V, because they're both the short sides of the uh, both isosceles triangles, R to R as they are to V. So now, we can simply do some cross multiplication and we can find delta V. And why do we need delta V? Well, you probably already know that 
uh, acceleration is simply delta v over delta t. So now we plug that in. We get acceleration, or in this case, centripetal acceleration, is equal to uh, delta v, which is v delta l over r, and then we have delta t over here. And now you see this part of the fraction, delta l over delta t is just velocity. So we have ac is equal to v over r times v, or ac equals v squared over r. And now, here's more magic. If we wanted to calculate uh, the net force given by this acceleration, then we use fc equals mv squared over r. How is this one proved? Well, we don't have to go through another long, elegant geometric proof, but simply realize that sigma f is ma. And now, we realize that fc must be mac this way. And plugging in mac, we get mv squared over r. Truly beautiful. And you can even rewrite this as just mac. So now, let's solve one problem with this to end it all off. Oh, it's just one second. Okay, so let's say that we have a five kilogram ball that is traveling at exactly six meters per second, uniform velocity, with a two meter radius. We're going to find AC and FC. And now using our hard earned equations, we can find AC, V squared over R, six squared over two, is equal to 36 over two, equals 18 meters per second squared. And now FC, just MAC, which is five times 18, is 90 newtons. That's it, thank you everybody for watching. We'll see you in the next circular motion problem. Let's take this tennis ball and slap it. Saborno Isaac Bari, who is known as the god of mathematics, became the youngest professor in the history of mankind.